coming up on UGTV. Standing committee meetings of the unified government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. A meeting of the Neighborhood and Community Development Standing Committee. This will be followed by a meeting of the Economic Development and Finance Standing Committee. Gosh, I get to talk just a little bit more. I love to talk just a little bit more. Hopefully they've got their levels and I can stop bothering people. Development Standing Committee. We want to welcome you all to this meeting. Public comment is welcome. Anyone wishing to speak on an item on the agenda may do so when the item comes up. We would ask you to limit your, your comments to three minutes. You step forward to the podium, uh, introduce yourself, and uh, for accurate recording purposes, uh, we ask that you speak directly into the microphone. Would the clerk please read the roll? Roll call, Walters? Here. Merguia? Townsend? McKernan? Here. Walker? Here. The record should note that Harold Johnson is in attendance tonight uh, as a distinguished substitute for uh, Ann and Gail, and uh, thank, with the thanks words. to him, we have a quorum. So we'll begin. Um, I think next up was the approval of the minutes from the March 17, 2017 meeting. Is there a motion for approval? Second. A motion and second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, well, I guess we only have one item on the agenda before us tonight. Uh, uh, which consists of the uh, land bank interest. Uh, Mr. Chris Slaughter, uh, director of the land bank or land bank manager, is present. Um, we got to drag it out a little. So <laughs> I do have I do have one question for him. Okay. On the uh, applications, but I don't know if he wants to set up the applications first. Uh, I did prepare a presentation. We can when okay. we get to that point, we can address it if you'd like. Well, why don't we let Mr. Uh, Slaughter uh, put on his presentation, and if uh, we need to identify anything to discuss in particular, we can. Okay, Mr. Slaughter, go right ahead. All right, thank you. Good evening, commissioners. We'll get right into it. Uh, first, we have four transfers to the land bank. Um, these are all properties from Habitat for Humanity. Um, as some of you may know, they have kind of consolidated services with their uh, counterparts on the Kansas City, Missouri side. And after going through their inventory, they have deemed that these four and possibly a fifth one that may come up here in the future um, just currently don't fit their building needs. So they're asking to have them come back to the land bank. Um, 
I went by and took some pictures of um, the condition of them. I think there was a concern about uh, are we taking these properties back that are in a um, unkept state and I was very surprised we asked them and they did go ahead and uh, take care of these get them cleaned up for us and with our new SOAR initiative we'll keep them in this state so the, re the request will be that we would uh, accept all these as transfers I just have two questions before we do that uh, first question is they've deemed all of these non buildable Because they, they just believe that right now, the way their strategy and their, their ah, so not that churning everything out. Not that these, the site is unbuildable, correct. but it does not fit their building plan at the moment. At this Got point. Got it. Okay. And are these properties that they would have likely gotten from the land bank? They did get these the from us at some point, yes. Okay. So in a way, they're just returning them back to us. All right. These, um, they're, I guess their new model is not so much new construction as well. That's my understanding from talking to the folks over at Habitat for Humanity. Um, they are working um, with us to partner on our initiative with the neighborhood's um, re revitalization strategic area through okay. um, community development department. So um, they're definitely not looking at as much new construction in their future uh, as more reinvestment into existing housing stock. Okay. And, and I'll just add that they are part of our contractor pool for the rehab. So they do get notification of when we do take houses in, as we'll talk about here soon. Um, so there may be some opportunities in the future where they would be uh, getting a house to rehab for us. Well, I would move to approve the transfer of these four. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion and second. Uh, any further discussion? None appearing. Uh, would the clerk read the roll? Roll call. Johnson? Aye. Walker? Jim? I think she said you said Walker? <laughs> yes. Walters. She said Walker. You said Walker? <laughs> Walker? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Walters? Aye. I'm just used to a different order. Yeah, that's, uh, good. <laughs> good. that's all right. Um, Before we I, move on, I, I see uh, a former councilman in the audience. I, I would like to acknowledge him. Joe Vaught, thank you for coming. Local businessman and uh, councilman had a good run when he was here. <laughs> I was a young pup then, wasn't I? Yeah, we both were. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, okay. Before we get started with the applications, uh, Commissioner Townsend last week requested that 2201 North Halleck Street and 2213 North Halleck Street be um, pulled out and represented next month. Um, so we won't talk about them in the presentation, but we'll ask that they not get uh, voted on tonight. Uh, but we do have 17 to touch on, 11 yard extensions, one property acquisition, uh, one uh, new family construction, uh, commercial improvement property, and we do have three rehabs. Um, all applicants currently are current on their taxes and have no code violations. Um, these are the yard extensions, 1718 South 17th Street. This was one we talked about last month. Um, I was asked to get a public works to go out and look at it. Um, as of today, I still haven't heard anything from them. Um, but again, I will add that everything here in black outlined is already currently owned by the applicant. The one in red is the land bank property and this green area is owned by the, uh, I believe the railroad. Other applications, um, Alfred Walker Jr. This is 91st Street. We did seize this some time ago through a, a drug seizure we obtained it back in uh, January of 07. Um, there was really no plan for it. The house, or the, it actually was a church at one point, but that's been demoed. So the plan would be is to combine the properties, add a multi-bay uh, car garage. Um, that's the plan for that one. Then we have another yard extension, 71 South 12th Street. The ones, again, outlined in black are the applicant's property, and then the red next to it is land bank. 515 South or Shawnee Road. Um, these do do touch, so we went ahead and put this as yard extension. 3041 North 20th Street. 
2300 rear South 39th Street. This doesn't have a, a structure on it, as you can see, but there's really no other plans I think we could get an individual to do other than the current owner. 2416 North 10th Street, 1039 Cleveland Avenue, 3001 Farrow Avenue, and the applicant's property is here to the south of it. 1119 Custer Avenue. Could you go back on that one? Oh, I see the black lines now. I did. Okay. I missed them. Thank you. 3405 Longwood Avenue. The one property acquisition we have is 1855 uh, North 31st Street. Um, the applicant, Ms. Miller, is does not live in Wyandotte County, so she we just put Kansas City, Missouri. Um, in her application, she stated that her maiden name was Brown. In doing some looking into it, um, it appears that her family was the previous owner. The property got put into a tax sale back in 2010. So um, myself, along with the advisory board, we're later going to make a recommendation that we probably need to deny this. Uh, we don't normally um, sell property back to family members that would go ahead and you know lose it in a tax sale. The only reason it's here before you today is by the time we got everything entered into the system, we, this is when we discovered it. Single family construction, 2745 North 91st Street. This is just a little bit up the street from the other one we talked about on 91st. Again, seized, seized through a drug seizure by the police. We obtained it. Um, the applicant is planning 1,600 square foot, three bedroom, two, two and a half bath. That should be two and a half uh, property. Um, Mr. Lockwood is here if there's any questions about that build. Commercial improvement, 7219 Call Drive. Um, I will note this is in the process of being created into one property as 7219. That's why we don't have two addresses up here. Um, Mr. Vaught, who you mentioned earlier, is the owner of this property here. And so he's seeking to purchase this property, these two properties, which are currently in the land bank. Rehabs, 2028 South 15th Street. Um, this picture here also outlines um, some of the steps the land bank's taking in boarding and securing properties. Um, we go back and just in indicate that um, if there's damage to the roofs, we are tarping them. This is one of the first ones we tarped. We're now tarping them in brown, so it kind of blends in a little bit more than just the blue. Um, we are also now uh, asking that the contractors that do our work um, paint these uh, any front windows too, so they'll be painted the same color as the door. In fact, all it, we're just using one color, so everything you see will be that. Um, Summit Waters is the applicant. They've done over 30 um, renovations in Wyandotte County over the last three years. Um, they specialize in buy and hold and mainly rent those. And what was most intriguing about us was, was their quick turnarounds. Um, on average, maybe 45 day turnaround on this. So they feel very confident that they could do that on here. Um, when we negotiate with them, we're we'll probably give them a little bit extra cushion, but um, we're really excited to work with them. Um, representatives from Summit Waters is also here in attendance. Just some of the pictures of the current state uh, status of the property. Mm. And these were the ones that we could put on TV as well. 1131 North 49th Street, again, uh, Summit Waters has um, applied for this one. Um, kind of the same deal. Um, we're hoping that they're successful and because we feel we'll have plenty more for them to come back. Some pictures here, uh, again, of the status. As you can see, there's some, some roof damage there. And uh, Mr. Brockman in our department, uh, when he inspected it, he came across this and it kind of gave him a good startle, but it was a prosthetic leg. So we just thought for a laugh we would uh, do that. Um, Colby, we, we may ask that that go in the Land Bank Museum at one point, so, but. Uh, <laughs> and the final rehab is 234 South Faree Street. Um, we have had, this is one of the first houses we had. Um, but when we did an open house, we didn't get any bids on it. 
So we've been approached as our pool of contractors have grown. We were approached by M&K Repairs. They have over 20 years experience. Um, they're actually going to rehab it and reside there. They're relocating from California. Fry Construction is partnering with them, which is one of the applicant's fathers. So we do have a local um, tie to the property that we feel um, good about. So just some uh, pictures. We, we really feel that this, in the current state we got it, is, is in pretty decent shape. Um, as you can see, there, there had been some previous attempts um, for some fixing. Um, there also had been some squatters in there too. Uh, now going back, the, uh, met with the advisory board and they want to recommend again to deny the Miller application due to the same family previously losing the property in the tax sale and then forward the remaining applications for final approval. Do we want to take care of that one first? Well, let me ask, what is the relationship? Uh, to what degree is it a cousin, an aunt, an uncle? Uh, she, all she indicated was family and she didn't indicate whether this was her parent, her grandparents, and uncles, but we generally in practice, if we know that someone lost the property in a tax sale and then they come back to us once they have it in the land bank, we generally just don't sell. If, if you want us to move forward with this, then we're probably gonna have to do some research to figure out what was owed at the time of the sale, what extra additional taxes maybe have been, would have accumulated in that time, I mean, we just don't feel it's fair to wipe all those taxes away and then resell it at a reduced price. Is the applicant here tonight? I, I don't know. It's in my district, so. Uh, all right. The application says that, it was, says that it was a father that once owned it at one time and that they thought that, that they still owned it, but they didn't. Apparently it went into tax sale and uh, I suppose, I guess they live in Missouri? Correct, they, they do not own property in Wyandotte County. Right now. So, that's all the information I have. Okay, thank you. All right, let's, uh, let's address this first. Yeah. Is there a motion? So moved. To accept the land bank's recommendation for denial. Yeah. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and second with the clerk. Please read the roll. The motion is to deny the uh, application and accept the advisory board uh, recommendation. Roll call. Johnson? Aye. Walters? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Walker? Aye. Okay, that recommendation uh, from the advisory board was approved. Uh, uh, Commissioner McKiernan? And then if I could just ask, the three rehabs, first of all, I just want to say I am thrilled to see that we are using our power to acquire uh, properties with structures on them and to facilitate getting those structures saved before they go to demolition. So this is absolutely thrilling. And my question is this, I know that you're working on redoing the land bank policies and procedures and that that's gonna come back to us sometime soon. And what I was wondering, and this question is as much for my fellow commissioners as it is for Mr. Slaughter, is that would it make sense since all of these properties that he has acquired have either been through the tax sale or have been through us when someone's donated the property to us, would it make sense to try to just come up with some sort of administrative uh, transfer where Mr. Slaughter has his procedure all lined out, he has his pool of qualified contractors all lined out, and he can move these properties without having to bring them back one more time to us for approval? So I just wanted to, is that something that you think you could do? I, I think we're, we're starting that process. We think it's a good idea. I will add that a majority of these houses have probably already been boarded and secured for three or four weeks. And if it's approved tonight, it'll go to the June 5th, so, or June 15th, excuse me, meeting. So we're, let's just say another 10 more days of it sitting there with the possibility of someone breaking into it again and stuff. So our thought was as quickly as we can get these in, get them inspected, make a determination, get them boarded and secured, and then hopefully present them to our pool of contractors, the quicker we can get these things renovated and rehabbed. And then we can just come back each month saying, here's basically the, uh, the, the work that's been done so far since the last time we met. So rather than bringing all of these forward for approval, you could simply bring a report of the activity that's happened since the last meeting. 
I think that's kind of where we're. Oh, that heading. was kind of my thought because we've already seen these once and approved Mr. Slaughter to move forward with the acquiring the property, and at that point, I think any time we can shave off the timeline and get somebody in these properties, the better off we'll be. I, I like that idea. I also like the uh, back door where if a particular piece of property and, or, and or a contractor is of concern to any commissioner that there's an opportunity before you quickly move it to uh, say, wait, I want, I want this thing vetted fully in the, uh, by the commission or a committee. But that probably would be the exception to the rule. Uh, and you know, I have some ideas on. Um, I'd also like kind of on those if lines. If yeah, you have concerns that you decide to bring it before the commission, because you may have concerns that we're not aware of, and none of us would speak to if uh, you didn't uh, uh, bring it forward and note for us that well, this guy we've had him before, and he didn't, you know, didn't sure. do the job or whatever it might be, whatever the reason would be. Yeah, so. and, and we'll make sure that there's there's upper level knowledge of okay. who's going on and, and probably that will be the authority that we'll recommend. All right. Well, I would move to approve all of the remaining applications as submitted. Um, Mr. Chairman, I just want to make sure, are there two properties that need to be continued to next month? Do we need to make sure that we're, that we Pull those believe, out of the motion. I believe, yeah. Those, yeah, the, the the two on North Halleck. Right. Um, we we would I would accept that motion, excluding those two properties to be held over to the next next month. So moved. Motion motion and second. Uh, please uh, would have the clerk read the roll. Roll call. Johnson. Aye. Walters. Aye. McKiernan. Aye. Walker. Aye. And lastly, we have um, two donation requests, including one from uh, last month that we're bringing back. Um, 2905 North 13th Street, this is the one that um, we brought back from last month. Uh, there was some concern about the condition of the lot. Again, this picture was taken Friday and it was uh, in good shape, and the requester has just stated that he no longer wants the property. Um, it is this one here in black this time. I will note we do have a land bank property to the south, so there is the possibility of maybe one large land bank property that maybe in the future we can get developed. Uh, but there is obviously a land bank presence in the neighborhood. The other one is 722 North 62nd Place. Um, this again is located right here in black. It's about a quarter of an acre in a you know pretty dense neighborhood. So um, we will either probably reach out to this property owner or maybe see about see if someone would want to build on that property as well in the future. And so our recommendation is to approve those two requests. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Please read the roll. Roll call. Johnson? Aye. Walters? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Walker? Aye. That would appear to conclude the business of this standing committee. Um, unless there's any further uh, issues, uh, I'll adjourn this uh, meeting and we should begin the next standing committee in six minutes. Exactly right. I Thank you. I think that is for
welcome everyone to the Economic Development and Finance Standing Committee. I'd like to remind everyone present that public input is welcome on any item that comes up before the committee for discussion and or decision. If you wish to make a comment on anything that the committee is discussing, you'd make you'd get my attention or the attention of one of the committee members. We'll invite you to the podium in the middle of the room where you'll have three minutes to make your comments to the committee. We do ask that anyone present who speaks on the committee or to the committee, please speak as directly as possible into a microphone for accurate broadcast and recording purposes. Roll call, please. Alvy? Walters? Here. Walker? Here. McKernan? Here. Johnson? Here. Fantastic. Our first order of business is approve our minutes from the March 27th, 2017 meeting. Motion to approve. Second. There's a motion and a second to approve the minutes as submitted. All in favor say aye. 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 All aye. opposed, same sign. Those are approved as submitted. That takes us to our committee agenda. We have three items on the committee agenda tonight. Item number one is an update on Casey Digital Drive. So Alan Howes is here from the UG, and then we welcome Aaron Deacon here tonight to give us an update on Casey Digital Drive. We'll turn it over to you. All right, Commissioner, thank you very much. And uh, this is an informational presentation. I wanted to bring before you uh, Casey Digital Drive. They have not spoken before this committee, but have been very active in the in the community um, on a number of different areas for a number of years and wanted to just give you a, a brief update uh, on some of their activities and uh, they've been a, a partner with the, the UG on efforts around everything from digital inclusion to connectivity to economic development. Um, so uh, they spoke to the Administrative and Human Services Committee back in February and wanted to get them in front of this committee um, and give you the update as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Aaron. Terrific. Thanks, Alan. Thank you, commissioners. Um, give you a, a short uh, kind of history for, for those who don't know who we are and where we came from. Um, we came out of the Mayor's Bias Innovations team that uh, former Mayor Reardon and Mayor James uh, appointed when uh, the, the cities were looking at what to do with Google Fiber. Uh, and uh, out of this uh, Mayor's Bias Innovations team came this uh, Kansas City's digital playbook, Playing to Win in America's Digital Crossroads. And that sort of set us on a trajectory uh, in starting a new civic organization called KC Digital Drive. Um, we really spent a couple years kind of getting our bearings. Uh, we incorporated as a standalone 501c3 nonprofit in 2013, 2014. And over the past three or four years, we've uh, really developed quite a broad swath of programming uh, and activities and network building that I'll get into a little bit. Uh, more throughout the course of this presentation. And um, over the past probably year and a half or two have uh, kind of taken that uh, sort of scope of work, as it were, and used that as a foundation for uh, how we, we start to reorganize. So we can, I don't have a lot in the presentation about that, um, but, but happy to take questions on that. Uh, I know Commissioner McKiernan, you've been a, a big part of our work from the beginning, although um, have, have lost contact a little bit uh, as, as this reorganization's happened, and part of that's with uh, Alan coming on board and uh, getting some other points into the city. So uh, we're really about building new civic capacity. Uh, you know, both cities, as long, along with the Chamber of Commerce and other civic organizations, have recognized that as technology changes, uh, we need to develop some new civic capacity to adapt more quickly, uh, both to technology opportunities um, and to the innovation economy. And that's really kind of what our wheelhouse is. We're really a, a civic platform for launching new kinds of projects uh, and opportunities that explore technology infrastructure. Uh, we take an ecosystem approach, and we spend a lot of time cultivating the community and the ecosystems around things like the digital divide, the healthcare, digital health ecosystem, the education ecosystem, the smart city ecosystem, because you need that broad-based community support in order to identify and, uh, and push forward projects within those areas. So there's a community building aspect to what we do, uh, and then uh, really a, a sort of project management, project execution phase to what we do. And so these are some of the examples of the, the communities and the projects that have happened within these areas uh, on this ecosystem model. Uh, just highlight a couple specific kinds of projects um, because there's a, a pretty good breadth to the kinds of things that I include in projects. Um, this is a, a website that has been built through Code for KC. This is a weekly hacker meetup. Um, 
hacker is a little bit of a loaded term, a weekly developer meetup where people get together and sort of build projects for civic good. This is highlighting uh, things like uh, community gardens, neighborhood potlucks, uh, other neighborhood improvement initiatives um, uh, on the idea that you know a lot of times people in a neighborhood want to take on a new project but don't have access to other people or other people who have uh, done similar things throughout the metro area. So working with Community Capital Foundation, uh, we've helped create this map uh, that is populated and updated on a regular basis. Uh, this is a, uh, a gigabit project, kind of going back to our roots and thinking about how do you leverage next generation internet uh, and gigabit fiber. Uh, this is a project led by a teacher in the Turner School District, Laura Gilchrist, uh, that is uh, working with CERN, which is which manages a big uh, super collider over in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, and they're actually running pilot projects here with uh, students in the Turner District and uh, under Laura's leadership, uh, along with another guy, Anurag Patel, who uh, was recently at KU Med, looking at how do you use gigabit internet in the home to do distributed supercomputing. You can ask me more in the question session if you want to know what that means. But it's a it's a pretty cool opportunity. They've both been over to uh, to London once, and I think are arranging another trip over to Geneva, and uh, working with some KU professors to uh, scale that program. This is a uh, uh, more of an infrastructure project. This is something called the Digital Town Square. Uh, part of the advantage of having uh, all of the different gigabit to the home internet providers that we have here is that we can allow them to talk to each other and keep their, that traffic local without having to go necessarily to data centers in Dallas and Chicago. Uh, and so this is a uh, just a, a, a real, real light sketch model of something called the Digital Town Square that allows us to keep that gigabit traffic local and also allows us to be able to have more seamless connectivity to other cities with gigabit uh, connections to the end users like Chattanooga or Burlington, Vermont, uh, San Diego, um, Phoenix are among the others. I'll talk a little bit more about US Ignite, the organization that's made this possible. Um, but we, uh, I, I think, I, I don't know for sure, I just got back from vacation last night, but we were supposed to hook up with uh, the Kansas um, Research and Education Network while I was gone. So I think. Uh, that we should be we should be live with our first connection um, in in Kansas on this network. And just to, I'll just jump in there if you go back sure. to that to see if I can. This is a this took me a while to get my head around what this concept is of a digital town square, but essentially if you sort of think about it, most of, of the internet traffic when you go on, on online goes to say California and then goes back even if it's across state lines to Missouri or um, you know goes to the east coast or goes to chicago somewhere like that so there's a there's a, a latency built into the system that uh, makes it difficult for some workloads in, in computing terms to uh, to work as well as they could or should and so part of the evolution of the of the internet is you know, how do you localize in a sense what it, you know you, We've, we have a worldwide resource, but in some, some cases we really want to localize that traffic. So rather than hitting servers or other places in California, we're keeping it local. And, and to put it in, a, in an example, music is one that, that people think about. If you actually try to play music with somebody who was you know, on the other side of town, uh, out by Village West, for example, or in, in Missouri, there's enough latency in the, in the internet now that it would just be off. Your ear would, would, dis would distinguish it. Something like this, and again, this is a very basic example, you would keep that traffic local, you would actually be able to have a, a virtual sort of musical session where you wouldn't have any of that latency. You would feel like you were literally sitting in the room with that person. So, so it's a sort of getting to the cutting edge of what is the potential for some of these next generation applications and use of really high speed internet. And to follow on that last example, uh, you know, there's the opportunity to do that across cities too. And one of the emails that was waiting for my inbox this morning when I got in was a request from Adelaide, Australia, to do a, a, a real-time um, jazz session. There's a jazz musician there, so we're going to try to hook up sometime later this summer a, uh, a jazz musician in Kansas City and, and somebody in Adelaide to do a virtual session simultaneously over this over this kind of network. So, if I could just ask a question about, so, give me an example of where the local data center might be located. It's uh, 1102 grand. So, and it's not, so we have um, a cabinet at 1102 grand. We've gotten a, uh, a, a switch, a gigabit switch from National Science Foundation through, through US Ignite. Uh, and our work now is to get as many people hooked into that as, can, as we can so that they can exchange traffic locally. Hmm. And we've got Genie servers, uh, uh, which is another piece of the infrastructure here, one on the UMKC campus and one in K, KU's Lawrence campus. So I have a 
geeky question I'll ask you later about how do you ensure the traffic goes to your slice controller without going out to the internet and then coming back to it. How do you keep it local? Because if it, anyway, I'll ask you that later. And, and, and I'll probably send you to Jonathan Wagner, who's the guy who would be able to answer that question which is, in terms of. Which is also part of, part of this is that it hasn't really been done before. So we're helping to try and work through some of those questions and, and well, digital drive is, um, putting this effort together. So you know, like I said, it really is kind of getting into the cutting edge of uh, what the internet can do. Okay. And I'll come back on this, on this program in a minute because there's a little bit more to say on US Ignite. Um, the reason I picked these three projects, not just because they've got uh, a presence here in Wyandotte County, but it's, it's a, a hint of the breadth of kinds of things. So one was kind of building an app or a website. One was a more programmatic uh, build. This is an infrastructure build. Uh, we've probably got 50 or 60 projects at any given time throughout our network uh, that we are working to support. Uh, and as I, as I said kind of at the beginning, a lot of that, uh, what we do is, is to bring people together. Um, so we host a number of meetings we've created uh, or, or continue to maintain a number of ongoing work groups, steering committees, um, and, and, and such within the community. Uh, but we also spend a lot of time um, trying to elevate that uh, work here and expand the Kansas City brand, uh, the, the regional Kansas City brand, as well as uh, you know Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas, and our other city partners here uh, on a national stage. And there's a lot of attention right now on Kansas City. Uh, it's important to us, you know, in particular uh, since we were founded by Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, to to make sure both of those cities get uh, um, the the credit they deserve uh, and the opportunities to be. Um, to be innovating and included. So this U.S. Ignite, uh, which has supported the Digital Town Square, was actually a, about a $300,000 grant over a few years. It supported the hardware that goes into the Digital Town Square, as well as some staff time uh, to answer the questions that you were just asking <laughs> and, and build this out. Um, uh, Joe Connor came down last year and accepted the, I, I should have brought our little flame statue as one of the inaugural, inaugural smart gigabit communities uh, that were part of this grant. Um, Metro Lab Network is a, uh, a collection of 38 city university partnerships that we worked uh, here to establish locally between KCMO, KCK, UMKC, and KU. Um, and it really fosters uh, both within uh, the metro area uh, the opportunity for researchers and cities to be able to partner on active projects. Um, and we've been able to, uh, through this partnership, send uh, people out to some broader convenings, uh, Trenton Fogelsong. Uh, from Public Works, went to a green water uh, workshop last October and uh, talked a little bit about some of the stormwater work you're doing. Gordon and uh, Crystal uh, from the uh, Judicial Department. Municipal Court. Uh, municipal Court uh, went to a, uh, a big data and human services convening. Um, so this is something that, you know, we don't think uh, every city in Kansas City needs to have its own, uh, you know, liaison to this network uh, and, and to all these convenings, but we do want to make sure that the cities who are engaged have an opportunity to go, and we think it's important that, uh, that we have multiple cities as represent, representatives of this network in the region, and we're, we're proud to be able to have Kansas City be one of the partners in this, in this network. The, uh, uh, there are national meetings in Atlanta, I think, in September uh, with, with Georgia Tech. The Global Cities Team Challenge is uh, uh, another kind of national smart cities, international smart cities uh, network uh, sponsored by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. We have sponsored several action clusters, which is kind of their project unit. You'll notice all these networks, for the most part, are, are project-based, which is a nice fit for us. Uh, and we're helping to lead with, uh, with Alan the healthcare supercluster. So through NIST, they've got a collections of projects across cities in different areas. Uh, so we're working on healthcare and, and some smart city issues. Uh, then, of course, we do the Gigabit City Summit here in Kansas City. We bring uh, several hundred people to Kansas City. This will be our third year coming up in August. Um, we have a, uh, a local event, one-day event for people who don't want to spend three days necessarily, but do want to understand more about how all these national networks uh, intersect with what's going on in Kansas City. Uh, so uh, Westport Commons on June 16th, certainly invite uh, you or anyone on your, your staff or in your networks to come and, and join us to learn a little bit more about our, our programs uh, here. Uh, Next Century Cities is, a, is another national network. It's about 150 or 175 cities who are really interested in broadband issues and broadband leadership. Uh, they do a lot to highlight um, mayors. We helped uh, to get uh, 
Mayor Holland and Mayor James both to sign a recent letter around municipal broadband access that got some publicity locally uh, and, and nationally as well. Uh, so, you know, this is just, it's, it's, it's not easy to necessarily explain what all these networks do um, in, in detail in a, in a short time, but uh, there are a lot of things happening um, nationally, and Kansas City's really gotten to be at the forefront of a lot of them. So that's, uh, as we've built up our local portfolio of work, we really wanted to share that and be able to um, kind of bring ideas back from other places in the country to Kansas City and continue to share what's happening here. Uh, we've got a, a very small staff. Um, it's really a network-based organization, so we've got a lot of network organizational partners, uh, some volunteers, and a, and a few staff people. Um, we had one other full-time staff who, who left about a year and a half ago, uh, but have supplemented that with a number of contractors and um, support staff uh, and some, some grant-funded staff. Uh, this kind of gives an overview of what our funding has been and where we are now. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we were started by uh, the cities by, by Mayor James and, and uh, then Mayor Reardon, and we've gotten some ongoing city funding uh, from time to time. Uh, we've got some grant funding. We've gotten some corporate sponsorship money. The Gigabit City Summit helps us uh, to earn some, some income as well. And just wanted to close with uh, a few of the things that we have um, going forward that I, I think are, are pretty exciting. Uh, I talked a little bit about the Gigabit City Summit coming up, which is a, a nice opportunity uh, for Kansas City. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time on these platforms for advanced wireless research. This is an NSF um, solicitation for a, a wireless research test bed. So they're offering uh, to seed four different national test beds at about $20 million a piece. We submitted our pre-proposal with KU as the lead applicant uh, about a week ago. Um, Alan's been involved in that work group, and we've got um, uh, some opportunities for uh, for Wyandotte County, um, possibly downtown, but certainly on the KU Med Center campus to be included within that. Um, we're working uh, as, as part of this. Uh, we set up an infra infrastructure innovation consortium um, with uh, Mid-America Regional Council and the Greater KC Chamber of Commerce as foundational members so that we can evaluate opportunities like this power grant on a more systematic basis. There's a lot of these things that kind of come through our door uh, that we end up oftentimes having to kind of recreate from scratch the, the partnership network that we go to and say, oh, are you interested in this? So we want to become a little bit more systematic about uh, how we do that. Um, <clears throat> uh, I was recently appointed uh, to one of the working groups for FCC's Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee. Uh, so that gives us a chance to have, uh, uh, to kind of weigh in on how federal policy is made um, around broadband access issues. Uh, we continue to work uh, on a digital health component to the Smart City, uh, the, the Healthy Camps project uh, that Mayor Holland has been pushing downtown and uh, have gotten uh, a lot of interest from KU in, in partnering on that. And uh, through all this, we've been able to, um, to work at bringing several other convenings to town so to you know, keep drawing attention to Kansas City. Um, so not all of these are public yet, but the Meeting of the Minds, uh, I believe, which is the oldest Smart City Conference in the U.S., will be here next year. Uh, Smart Cities Connect, um, which uh, Joe and I went down to uh, last year, uh, I think will be here next March. Uh, we've got the IEEE International Smart Cities Conference that we're planning for next September. Um, and there's also a potentially a Living Cities event that will be here this fall. Uh, so some, some exciting things happening. For, um, that, that, that wraps me up. I'm, uh, I will take questions. I've probably gone over a little bit my lot of time, so I apologize. Well, for, thank you for the update. Along. Really looks like you've been doing a lot of work. Anybody have any comments or any questions for well, Mr. Deacon or Mr. House? I won't pretend like I understood everything that you talked or even half of it, but um, what I do I think I understand is economic impact. And so I see a lot of projects that you all have that you're working on. Can you talk about what the potential economic impact of these projects are in terms of our overall um, metropolitan area, maybe even K KCK. Uh, is there kind of a dollar figure that you can attach to uh, the things that we're working on somehow? I'll tell you, I, I can talk about economic impact. I'm, I'm always reluctant to, on, on, the, on the dollar figure piece, and I've worked with some economic developers who have their, you know, in plans, they come up with their formulas, and there are so many steps a lot of times between what we do and how they get those, it, it, that, that gets a little fuzzy to me. But I will say, um, uh, a few different things. 
that, that I think are at least the paths to economic impact. I mean, one is, is just business creation. So we've got a company, uh, for example, Planet Impact, uh, which came out of a hackathon that we did three years ago, um, has been, uh, has, has gotten a couple grants from the Mozilla Gigabit Community Fund and from US Ignite, uh, was recently accepted into the Smart City Works Accelerator in Virginia, but uh, they're not moving, they're gonna come back, and they've had a, a pretty nice growth trajectory. So I think there are, um, and that's one of a handful of businesses that have been started through kind of the, the hackathons that we've done. Um, there has been a lot of, I mean, I think the, uh, the, the attention uh, and, and continuing to be on sort of the, the Kansas City stage um, in, in all these smart city conferences I think is really valuable, really working to build Kansas City as a place where companies that are in that space uh, want, to, want to come and, and grow. Um, through one of the one of the thoughts behind the infrastructure innovation consortium is to really brand the Kansas City region as as kind of the the place that builds the world's infrastructure. Uh, we've got a lot of companies that do that here. Uh, BHC Roads um, is is one of the companies that's a big sponsor of the Gigabit City Summit for the past couple of years, and so uh, we see an opportunity. And it's hard, frankly, for a lot of the engineering companies sometimes to kind of figure out what the right model is to incorporate all the technology into their infrastructure. Um, but we want to make sure that, that Kansas City captures that. And so even growing, you know, whether it's BHC Roads or Burns and Mac and Black and Beach or anybody in between, um, being able to grow those businesses and attract new businesses that are in those spaces here, uh, we see as, as, a, as a strong opportunity. And then we work a lot with the startup community more broadly, um, you know, Kansas City Startup Village um, and uh, some of the people at Coffin Foundation uh, to, to create uh, fertile ground for that, for that ecosystem. And I'd say, kind of the last point on that, one of the things that we do and when we talk about economic development is to cultivate the, the demand side for technology innovators. Uh, so in healthcare, I mean, you've got 100, I mean, you've got, you got healthcare startups all over the place. And people are oh, I'm gonna try to do something with electronic medical records or new devices, but the, the buyer community isn't always ready to receive those things. So what we do is we, bring together the digital health innovators from the health system side. So we have the KU Meds and the Children's Mercies and the Trumans to, to think about it really from, from kind of the, the buyer side um, and help get them ready and make matches that are meaningful so that people can, can go forward. Any other comments or questions? If not, thank you for, and will all the other commissioners get a copy of the presentation slides? Excellent make sure they get those. Thanks for the update. Appreciate your work. And um, we look forward to more great stuff in the future. Great. Thank, Thank you, you all. That will take us to item number two on our agenda tonight. And that is a report of the first quarter 2017 budget to actual. And that's submitted by Kathleen Von Atchen. <clears throat> Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Kathleen Von Atchen, the Chief Financial Officer, and I'm happy to have my Budget Manager, Budget Director, Reginald Lindsay here next to me. We're going to go over the um, Q1, or first quarter report of our budget compared with the actual spending for the Unified Government's General, general Fund. And uh, we're also, um, the second agenda item, we're also going to touch on any kind of budget revisions that exceeded $10,000, as well as uh, maybe one or two that may have been higher than that, or around uh, over $50,000. Um, in the agenda packet, we submitted uh, the first quarter report. You know, as you know, we provide these four times a year. Um, so the first quarter report doesn't have a, you know, a lot of information, but we're happy to, you know, talk about it in more detail. But uh, at this point, I just wanted to give you an opportunity. If you had any questions, if you had already reviewed the report, then um, and you didn't have any questions, I <clears throat> I have always been curious uh, over my many years here, uh, especially in light of technology today. Um, here we are in June, almost to the end of the second quarter. And, and I don't mean this as a, as a criticism. Some of it may be scheduling, putting it on the uh, agenda and so forth. But it would seem like to me that at the close of business, March 31st, 
you you have either taken in a certain amount of money as of that date at midnight or you have spent a certain amount of money now there may be all kinds of things in process but it isn't paid till it's paid and it isn't received till it's received so can you explain to me why on April 1st or July 1st or within a day or two of the close of the quarter we can't get a very close if not precise what we spent as of that date why you can't just go to the computer and say spit it out and there it is what what am I missing about our technology which from when I began is like light years ahead that we can't get a first quarter report before almost the end of the second quarter uh, so um, we uh, so to answer your question um, there are hundreds of thousands of uh, transactions that are recorded throughout the you know daily um, uh, those revenues are recorded over in the in uh, by our treasurer's office and um, on a daily basis we in effect balance the checkbook um, by doing a bank reconciliation and so um, those typically take a you know quite a few they're usually about a week or two behind you know because it takes a while to make sure all the transactions um, have been properly posted in the right account and that we know where they all are so there's a, a closing period that takes about two, two, well, two or three, four weeks, um, in, in order to make sure that everything is recorded in the proper place. Um, and then, um, and then there's, and then what? What? Uh, what the other thing happens is with this committee, where um, as staff were required to submit the the report um, two weeks before the the actual committee meets. And so there's kind of a time lag there. And then it usually takes a couple of weeks for us to actually prepare the report. Um, so, and then the fact that we were in the middle of budget uh, put a little bit of a delay on it because we implemented a new budget system during this time. So, well, I, I, the, don't, I, I don't take it as a criticism because it's not. It's just. Yeah. It seems to me that if there is a problem that develops in the first quarter or the second quarter, by the time we get it, we're really too late in many cases to act upon it as a commission. Now, maybe staff is equipped to deal with it. Um, yeah, so, um, so uh, we, uh, I, uh, actually have some ideas for speeding up our bank reconciliation process and so um, those are some internal administrative functions that we're going to be looking to streamline in the future um, but um, for the most part what we're going to be doing in terms of this report is we're going to try to get it out as quickly as we can and uh, I hope that for the second quarter I hope to have it out sometime in August but you know let's keep our fingers crossed well, I I prefer to think that probably the reason it's late is because of Mr. Bach, but <laughs> that Mr. Bach wants to carefully review it before we get it, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Just kidding, just kidding. For the TV audience, I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you. I just, it, it just seems like to me that with the amount of money we've spent on technology over the last 15 years at least, we ought to be able to spit this thing out within a week of uh, the close of the quarter, but that shows perhaps how little I know about technology. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, all right. So um, this is for, these are for transactions that occurred between January 1st and March 31st, and uh, for the general fund, as you know, there's three. There are three general. Uh, there are three funds that can, are considered the consolidated general fund. That's the city general fund, the county general fund, and the parks consolidated general fund. And um, the total budget for the 
three general funds uh, for fiscal 17. Um, on the expenditure side, is $209 million. Um, on the revenue side, it's uh, $204.5 million. And uh, so as you can see, what we've got here is um, uh, actuals in the next column and then a percentage of the budget. And the revenues have come in at $62 million so far through March 31st, which represents 30% of the total budget. Um, now, you would, because it's the first quarter, you would expect if, if revenues came in evenly throughout the year, you would expect a revenues to be at only 25%. So you can see that we're doing pretty well here. And we've got 30%. Now, the reason for this is because property taxes come in um, um, they pretty much come in half in the first uh, quarter and then the other half in the third quarter. So that, so that property tax variance um, uh, is the explanation for why our revenues seem higher um, at this point in time. On the expenditure side, you see that uh, we have, we've spent $48 million, which represents 23% of the total budget. So that's less than the 25%. So we're doing pretty good so far. And you know you can see that that's per those percentages are pretty consistent with the prior year. So now, and so the following um, three or four slides here are um, the um, just comparisons uh, with the, uh, broken down by the different funds. So um, on the revenue side for the city general fund, you can see the breakout. Here's property tax, sales tax, and all other types of um, fun, uh, revenues. So as you can see there, the, so far the revenues collected for property tax represent 56% uh, of the total. For sales tax, it's only, it's only at 19% of the total. But um, you know, as you know, this represents a period after Christmas where you know, the, property, the sales tax may be lagging a little bit. Um, other taxes at uh, basically 19.7, I believe, and uh, permits at 20. Intergovernmental revenues are at 61%. So overall, revenues uh, for the city general fund are at 25%, which is a right on where um, we expect them to be. And uh, the, the graph shows also um, how they compare with the prior year. Well, oh, um, yeah, it is down and, um, yeah, yeah. So my guess that, um, part of that, and I'm going to, in fact, I do know why that is. Uh, there has been a, a, there was a little bit of a lag in our, the recording of our distribution for sales tax because um, we were waiting to um, come to a final conclusion on uh, what was the soccer base. So, and what we call the soccer base in our finance department is actually that $12 million that everyone keeps talking about, the legends, um, as a result of the payoff of the star bonds. So what we needed to do, and it took about a month for us to really go through and comb through all the data and make sure that we absolutely had that amount precisely calculated. And so as a result, that act, those activities, the money could not be released until we all agreed to that number and that it was certified, and that didn't take place until April. So there was some money, uh, quite a bit of sales tax money held up in a trust until we could record it in April. So that's part of the reason why it's down. Yeah, that's part of the distribution. Ultimately, the, the star bond payoff amount, the, um, the amount that we're now going to be collecting every year as a result of the star bond payoff has been um, calculated to be $12.4 million. So. Um, the county revenues, um, same categories, property tax representing 56 percent, uh, the uh, same kind of uh, um, financial indicators for the county, 
except the county's at 44 uh, percent and as a total and uh, the reason that's because the, the reason that that, uh, the, that percentage is higher is because property tax makes up a greater proportion of the total revenues in the, in the county fund so so its early collection causes the higher percentage um, and then consolidated parks is you know not too big of a fund it's only 6.2 million and you, you see the same collection uh, for pro level property tax at 56 percent uh, so only, you were only seeing 19.8 percent of the total um, year-to-date collections and that's and that is because um, we typically don't enter the intergovernmental revenue on a quarterly basis and so you see how that 3.7 million it it looks like there's a zero there for year-to-date that's because the 3.7 which is actually a transfer from the city general fund to this fund to, to basically subsidize a lot of the activities related to consolidated parks. So, so the, that's missing the quarterly transfer payment. Then on the expenditure side, did you want to talk about it? Right here. Okay. Thank you. On the expenditure side of the city general fund, you see we spent like 23.4 percent of, of our budget um, under 25 percent is a is a good rule of thumb it means we're in positive ter territory with the expenditures at this point in time in the county gen general fund we've spent 23.1 percent we can see we have different categories personnel services supplies grants claims and capital outlay supplies we've spent over the 25 percent uh, generally what happens is some of the departments go out and buy up some of the supplies that they need early in the year but overall the budget is is at 23 percent in the county general fund in the consolidated parks fund we can see where um, 19 percent of the budget has been expenditure so expended so far in 2017 and we can see in grants and claims uh, there's a hundred and eighteen percent that has been spent and this is a just a grant that has, has gone out the full expense has gone out and it was a little more than what we expected so and it's it's like a six thousand dollar number as opposed to this budget for five thousand dollars so that's that's what that number is that kind of wraps up the expenditures well overall all the expenditures were under 25 percent which is a, a, in positive territory for so far in quarter one of 2017. any questions on here overall it's real good no one category really stood out as an outlier high or low and we're pretty much on our 25 percent projection mark for both income and expense in all funds so anybody have any comments or questions for Kathleen or Reginald? Good job. Absolutely. Appreciate the report. Thank you so much. And then, Mr. Lindsay, I think you have the transfers. Yes. So there's two transfer reports. One was for the budget revisions that were done within the first quarter of 2017, and then the other one was done uh, for those that were over $50,000 that the County Administrator and the Mayor signed off on. And so the, the ones that were $10,000 and over, there were eight transactions that were $380,000. Four of them were done within the City General Fund, three were done within the County General Fund, and one was done within the Elections Levy Fund. Uh, the lowest amount of the budget revisions that were done were the $13,000 budget revision that was done for the Justice Center uh, to replace a transformer that went out largest amount on the sheet was a $94,000 budget revision for the police department where they shifted their priorities and bought, kind of shifted their CMIP around and bought some equipment that was more in uh, 
meeting for them. And that was one we also brought uh, for last, <coughs> last month also. There, there are three on this sheet that we bought for last month, uh, one from the election levy, one from the police department, and then one also from the sheriff's department. And all these eight, um, one of them was done from, from contingency. All the rest of them were done within the department. So as usual, they're all overall budget neutral in terms of the dollars. Yes. Great. And then there was one uh, on, on the other report, one that we did, uh, a $508,000 one for legal costs. It was it also went through the special session with the commission. And that was the one that was that the county mayor and the county mayor we end up doing this on an annual basis somewhat regularly, do we not? Because we really don't fund the liability fund <coughs> with like $5 million anticipating those kinds of losses. So we lowball, maybe that's not the correct word, but we lowball the fund. And then as settlements come before us, we realize we either have to move money around or we have to issue judgment judgment notes sometime during the year or at the end of the year. Is that not correct? Yeah, that, that is <coughs> correct. Um, actually, we have a, sol uh, we're proposing a solution in the upcoming budget for some of this. Well, I would love that just from a historical standpoint. It was always so what an issue. Our, the solution would be to set up an internal service fund, sort of a general liability or property and casualty insurance fund, um, and have the departments, based on their you know prior year, um, five years of uh, claims history, um, we would determine what percentage or what what percentage of their total share of the funding would be allocated and then we determine an, uh, an estimate of how much annually we ought to be contributing to this special fund. And the departments would then be charged and those revenues would go to that internal service fund and that's where we would pay all those expenses. If the expenses um, are less than we estimate, then the fund balance could re <coughs> remain there in that external fund and um, for you know to cover for future lawsuits or settlements uh, as they come so Would that's this the solution we're, we're looking at by allocating these resources does that suggest you're going to reduce the budget of the various departments by a uh, an amount uh, based on the previous five years experience uh, no, no, we won't be reducing. What we're going to be doing is making sure the departments have those respective budgets, whatever it is we estimate. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, so, the, the issue for the departments, we had years ago an idea about charging back against the budget um, as sort of an incentive to the department head to keep their people under control and not create liabilities, but obviously it's a very complex, I mean, police, for example, are more likely to be involved in incidents where people would file some kind of lawsuit or the street department uh, can only repair the streets that the commissioners fund them. And if a street defect or design flaw creates a liability, it's very difficult to predict that. And when you have a very large settlement it could, as long as, uh, you know, I think there should be some accountability for those departments, but I think it's not feasible to really punish them in a sense by reducing their budgets. And then the, uh, the end result of that is they always blame legal. The legal settled a case, legal gave the money away. Legal doesn't have the people to know what they're doing. I heard that for a lot of years. And, uh, you know, bottom line was we wouldn't have even, we don't need good legal if people don't create liability. So I just, 
I just wanted to make sure we weren't going down the road where department heads were going to start saying, well, legal gave the half million away. We wanted to go to trial or we wanted to, you know, fight or we had no, you know, that kind of uh, dialogue. So the, the, there's a couple of goals. Um, certainly accountability is one, one of them. Our, our intent is not to be putative to the departments. Um, the, the main goal is to ensure that there's sufficient funding to cover these unexpected um, expenditures, but then also be able to smooth out the cost so that uh, the general fund's not having to go up and down to hit it. But make I, it I would think out, that so. it's very good. It's yeah. a good, uh, worthy goal that it was always, you know, problematic and it always required money to be moved from somewhere. And usually we didn't have a fund just sitting there for us to pull money out of when we needed it. It usually came from the reserve fund or we issued debt. Yeah, I'd like to um, discourage the issuance of debt to pay legal settlements. It's not a best practice. No, I, I agree. <laughs> you brought that up before. It's not a good practice. Well, I mean, you know, if you get a $20 million judgment against you that's upheld, sure. you don't have any choice. But it depends you know, on the predictability is, yeah. of spending 500 to a million dollars, 500,000 to a million dollars a year is very predictable yeah. because we simply don't get, for example, an accident caused by a road defect. It's been there for 10 years. Uh, we're going to pay out some money on that because we should have fixed the pothole that caused the accident. Anyway, thank you. Sure. Any other comments or questions? Well, uh, so are you, on this most recent uh, expenditure, the 500000 when you are not going to issue debt to cover that, that's your current thinking? No. Was there any, um, on another topic, uh, the maintenance building that we had a problem with this last week, are you guys involved in any kind of financial issues related to that? Uh, yes. Well, we oversee, uh, the finance department oversees the uh, the, risk that risk management function with with relation to our facilities mm -hmm. and so Richie we, can talk about a little bit more here so for our building replacement we have a hundred thousand dollar deductible and it seems like the building could be valued at like one hundred three thousand and there was also contents in the building that, that we're still uh, trying to see how much the contents is worth and we have like contents on the building also around sixty thousand dollars that we have insurance for like so we'll have a hundred thousand dollar deductible Okay. Well, I, I didn't know that that was even insured. So, good. Thank you. So they're all insured. Yeah. yeah. So our insurance, all our buildings, we have a, a hundred thousand dollar blanket for all our buildings. And if a tornado came and knocked them all over, we'd only have to pay a hundred thousand dollar deductible to replace them all. Great. Thank you. Sounds great. Anything else? Thank you so much. Always appreciate the report. There are no other items on our agenda. We are adjourned. Thank you.